Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our second panel discussion about the COVID vaccine. Uh, we are, as the first one, only focusing on the facts. We've brought in some national and local scholars who will be talking to us about the vaccine, talking about disparities, and also discussing um, any answers to questions that you may have as we move forward. The evening will be moderated by our CEO, uh, Diane Bell McCoy. And then from there, we will turn things over to our panelists. And first I'd like to introduce all of our panelists to you. We have Dr. Peter Hotez, who is the Dean for the National School of Tropical Medicine, Baylor College of Medicine professor, and the Departments of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology. He's also the Endowed Chair in Tropical Pediatrics for Texas Children's Hospital. He is a university professor at Baylor University in the Department of Biology. And he also holds a faculty fellowship at Hagler Institute for Advanced Study. He's a senior fellow of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at Texas A&M University. And he's also the Baker Institute Fellow in Disease and Poverty and Adjunct Professor of Bioengineering at Rice University. We also have Dr. Lisa Cooper, who is a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, School of Nursing, and Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity and the director of Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute as well. And she's serving as the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. We also have Dr. Gregory Branch, who is the director of the Baltimore County Department of Health and Human Services. He's the health officer for Baltimore County government, and he's been nationally recognized as a certified physician executive. He is a faculty member of Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the School of Public Health and an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. And we also have Dr. Kendra McDowell, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. So we'd like to thank all of our distinguished panelists for joining us this evening and thank our guests for also joining us. And I'm going to now turn it over to Diane Bell McCoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you very much. And I want to add my thank you to all of our panelists that joined us this evening, but also a thank you to all of you in the audience that have joined us in terms of this is a part two for us to talk about COVID-19 and talk about the vaccinations, but also just talk about this in relationship to the history as it relates to African-Americans. For us, the importance is getting the facts out to our community. And with that, I can't even imagine having a better group of panelists more informed, more experts at this table. So again, thank you for making your time available this evening. Dr. Cooper, I really wanna start with you by asking you a question, because I think it's important in talking about the facts to talk about some of the history as it relates to the African-American community and the medical community and what that, how that has played out for us and how that may be contributing sometimes to some of the challenges but you are a renowned expert around health disparities and the relationship to that in terms of structural racism. Would you share with us some of that history? Sure, um, well, it's a very long history. As we all know, you know, um, slavery was started in this country over 400 years ago and there have been egregious acts that have been um, perpetuated against African-Americans throughout this time, um, beginning with slavery. And, um, because of this historical uh, experience that people of African descent have had in this country, we've actually suffered quite a, a great deal at the hands of institutions. And, um, you know, 
medicine and science is no exception to that. So we know that even during the time of slavery that, that many um, African-American women were subjected to, to surgeries, for example, without anesthesia or to hysterectomies um, that were not necessary for them. We know that you know um, everyone is familiar with the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study where African-American men and their families were not um, provided with treatment for syphilis even once it became available and they were just uh, studied and, uh, and allowed to continue to, to become ill over time until it became disclosed that this was going on. So we know that there are lots of things that, that people, black people have suffered at the hands of institutions, including scientists and, and um, the medical field. We know that there are disparities in healthcare and that we continue to experience racism um, in the healthcare system. That being said, um, I think that it makes it understandable that, that there is mistrust in our communities of um, you know, institutions and of um, scientists, for example. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is, is mistrustful. And I mean, certainly there are good relationships uh, between health systems and some communities and many um, black patients have excellent relationships with their physicians. So it's not necessarily something that's across the board, but it is an issue that has been around for a while and that many people have not forgotten. And so, you know, for that reason, many people may be skeptical of the information that's coming out right now uh, about COVID-19, um, regardless of race actually, but, but particularly uh, so among communities that have already been um, disadvantaged in our society. Thank you for sharing that history, but you've also shared with us, and we're going to go in momentarily to Dr. Hortez in terms of how important it is to get the facts out to our community in terms of to make sure those facts are part of addressing some of the fears and concerns and the importance of transparency of having that information be made available to the public. And so with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Hortez in terms of, again, thank you for joining us. Many people who follow has followed this over the past year, and I would note March the 11th, 2021 is one year anniversary, as I understand, in terms of for COVID-19, in terms of being declared a pandemic. But you've had a long, rich history in this space, in terms of actually being a part of the investigation and developing the vaccine SARS originally from a long period of years. Can you share with us some of that history? Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for uh, having me. You know, we've been working on coronavirus vaccines for the last uh, decade. And um, we have an interesting organization. We make the vaccines that the big pharma companies won't make. And so we make vaccines for uh, a lot of diseases, for instance, occurring on the African continent. Uh, one called female genital schistosomiasis, one of the most common afflictions of girls and women living in poverty in Africa. No one's ever heard of it. 40 million girls and women living in poverty in Africa are affected by it. We're making that vaccine. 10 years ago, we adopted a coronavirus vaccine program because nobody cared about coronavirus vaccines. And uh, so we started making SARS and MERS vaccines and showed how to deliver uh, the spike protein. And now we've hit the ground running making a COVID vaccine, but a different type, one uh, particularly for the African continent that's cheap, safe and affordable and can be easily distributed because those two mRNA vaccines are not gonna hit the African continent. They're too expensive to scale up. There's, they're not easy to scale up. They have the onerous freezer requirements, which you can never do. So we're hoping our low cost COVID vaccine will be uh, the first people's vaccine for, for the African continent. And now we're, we're producing that. The, um, the concern I have uh, now is what's happened with COVID-19 in the African American community. You know, one of the, one of the stories that not many people talk about is this virus is mostly hitting low-income neighborhoods uh, across the country. So black and brown people are really getting hit hard and they're getting hit hard for two reasons. One, that a lot of the number of people have spoken about, they're not working at home via Zoom and Skype. They're, they have essential work, they're in family-owned businesses, they're on construction sites, uh, they're getting exposed in, in large in the higher larger numbers. They're also coming home to households that are multi-generational households. So you have a you know a twenty year old working on a construction site or a family-owned business. He or she's coming home to the parents and the grandparents, 
and that virus just races through the home. So that's that's second problem. The third problem, and again, you're not really hearing about it a lot, is the fact that the narrative that's out there is COVID-19 is mostly a, a disease of people over the age of 65. It's not true in the African-American community. Uh, at least a third, maybe up to 35%, are under the age of 65. So what this virus is doing is it's destroying a dead generation of moms and dads uh, in the black and, black and brown communities in their 40s, their 50s, and 60s. And anybody who lives in an African-American neighborhood knows this, right? But it's, it's not being told, it's not being framed properly. So the thing that I'm so worried about is now with this new UK variant, these are the groups that are getting hit the hardest is those moms and dads. I mean, these are, you know, 40, 50, these are parents of teenagers, parents of 20 year olds who are losing their lives. And so problem number one, problem number two, they don't have access to vaccines, uh, vaccinations, because you don't have, you know, we relied so heavily on the pharmacy chains for this. A lot of low income neighborhoods are pharmacy deserts. So so not having access to pharmacies is a problem. And third, you have pretty high rates of uh, concern about vaccines and distrust of vaccines, in part for all the reasons that were just discussed, but also there's this other sinister component that we don't hear enough about, and that is anti-vaccine groups are specifically targeting African-American communities, flooding them with fake information. This is their modus operandi, they did this with the Somali immigrant community in 2017. The ringleaders of the anti-vaccine movement staged town hall meetings. They came in, uh, filled them with a lot of misinformation claiming vaccines cause autism. Parents stopped vaccinating their kids, it caused a measles epidemic. Then they did it with the Orthodox Jewish community in 2018. They're sort of groups that are kind of tightly knit and they take advantage of that. And now they're doing this uh, in 2019, they st staged these Harlem vaccine forums claiming vaccines are the next Tuskegee experiments and, and this kind of stuff. So a lot of damage that, that they've been doing. So all of this is a perfect storm. The fact that the virus is disproportionately affecting people in their 40s and 50s in the African-American community, the pharmacy deserts lack of access in low-income neighborhoods, and this targeting by anti vaccine groups and now you've got the new spike variants coming in the UK variant this this troubles me especially with so many good vaccines coming by the summer um, you know I want to save as many lives as, as I can you know between now and then can you talk more about the vaccine the vaccinations really in terms of both Pfizer Moderna and the Johnson Johnson I'm going to go back to Dr. Cooper in a moment as well but I know as you talked about 10 years of being involved in the development of uh, the SARS vaccine. But many people don't know that that happened for 10 years, that that was in the development stage. Can you share more about the facts about that and how when people heard the warp speed, they were alarmed? Yeah, I don't know who came up with that name. It was a horrible name, right? And, and to make matters worse, you had the pharma CEOs sending out these press releases. And you know, when they send out a press release, you know, they're not writing it for you and they're not writing it for me, they're writing it for their shareholders. And they're spectacularizing their accomplishments and they made it seem like these vaccines came out of nowhere in a few weeks and having that operation warp speed moniker did not help in fact you know our group and a couple of others have been working for a decade showing that the spike protein was the soft target of coronaviruses how you deliver the spike protein how you need to induce virus neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein all that work that decade of research and development that provided the basis of the vaccine. You never heard that part of the story. So people were naturally suspicious to say, how can these vaccines be legit when they just came out of a period of weeks? Are we being experimented on or what? Well, no, it's actually the, the COVID-19 vaccines pretty much go by the same timeline that any other vaccine goes on. It's just that you never heard that other of the story and, I, and I, that's a part of the fact that we want to get out that it has yeah so i'm glad i'm really glad you brought that up because people don't know that that part of the story dr cooper because i know you were involved in terms of some do you want to share more facts as it relates sure. to that as well yeah i'd be happy to do that well first i want to i'll say some of what i think is the bad news you know building on what dr hotez said but then i want to sort of end up with 
some positive um, information for folks. So, um, you know, some good things that are happening. So the, the not so good news is, you know, obviously our communities of color have been much harder hit. We know that we've died at two and a half to three times the rates of whites from this uh, virus. We know that we've had hospitalization rates that have been much higher. We know all of the reasons, you know, that we've talked about because of us being, you know, overrepresented among um, essential workers and, um, and not having, you know, a lot of the access to care or to other resources that other people have because of structural racism. So that's the not so good news. The better news is that actually um, that vaccine skepticism and hesitancy, which we saw that was much higher among African Americans towards the end of last year has really decreased. So up to close to over 60% now of African Americans are saying that they would accept the vaccine, okay? So that's the good news. Um, and um, it's getting closer to the rest of the population, which is around 70, between 70 and 80%. So, you know, acceptance of the vaccine is increasing. And I'll tell you why I think this is going on. I think partially it's because um, we've had a number of role models from the African American community. We've had uh, physicians who are in those communities who have stepped up and become role models and have worked to get the message out. We've had organizations, community-based organizations like yours. Um, we've been doing this on a local level, but also on a national scale. Uh, a lot of social media campaigns. We've had radio programs where this has been focused on. So I do think the word is getting out and I'm glad that we're doing our part as well. Um, and I think that people have seen that some of their relatives who are frontline workers have had the vaccine and are doing okay with it. And they're now more willing to, to, to take that vaccine. So I think what's important is that when we see researchers partnering with community members, with trusted members of communities, like faith leaders, like community physicians, like other uh, organizations within communities, we can increase vaccine acceptance, okay? Now our rates are still not as high as they should be. And it's because I don't think, you know, the vaccination rates being lower it cannot be attributed completely to vaccine hesitancy or mistrust. Honestly, it's about the lack of access. And so we really now have to focus our efforts on that, making sure that people can get to places where they can be vaccinated. Dr. Hotez mentioned the fact that a lot of these vaccines go to areas or to pharmacies where they don't have branches like those in many communities mm -hmm. of color. Or they're having these large scale campaigns in convention centers or football stadiums that are far away from where people live. So we have to really go to people, go to where they are. And the good news is that there are many health systems that are using mobile vans, going out into communities, partnering with churches, for example, having vaccine events at community-based organizations. And that's what is going to help with this. The other thing that's going to help is making it easier for people to find out where to go and to sign up. A lot of people don't have computers or um, internet access. A lot of these vaccine signups are, require registration online. So we really need to work on more of these call centers where people can call in and have someone else assist them. We need to get people doing community outreach. And I, I've seen a lot of that happening where community health workers are going door to door, finding out if people need assistance with getting registered for vaccines while they're also working on the other issues as we know people have issues related to food insecurity. You know, um, they need help with finding housing. They need a lot of other issues addressed at this time. So I think a real grassroots effort is, is where we're seeing um, hope. And so even though, you know, it's been a, a very difficult time, um, as we all know, when America catches a cold, uh, Black America catches pneumonia, but I don't think all is lost. All hope is not lost. We are very strong and resilient people. And when we come together and use our resources, there's nothing that can stop us. I would agree with that. I do want to go back to Dr. Hortez, though, for a moment around, I really want to make sure we get out the facts about what is the difference in terms of Johnson Johnson versus Pfizer versus Moderna? What is that? What is the fact? What is that difference? There are people that are listening. There are people that are watching. There are people that really don't have a sense of what one is versus other and are hearing stuff from kind of social media. And here we have experts. I'd like to share from an expert perspective. Tell us about those facts. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you people are wringing their hands a lot saying, oh my God, which one of these should I take? Which one's the best for me and my family? And one of the things I say that surprises people is they all work the same way. They all work to deliver the spike protein and they're all good vaccines. And, and so the, even though the technology is different, the end, the end goal is the same, to deliver the spike protein to induce uh, virus neutralizing antibodies. So I make the point, don't, don't overthink it. Don't you know, wring your hands, oh my God, which one should I take? The worst thing you could do, is, I think I want that one and not get, and miss the chance to get the one you're offered. Uh, because right now things are in limited supply. By the summer, you're going to have, you'll have, you'll be allowed to make choices, but not mm -hmm. uh, vaccines are in limited supply. Unfortunately, that whole Operation Warp Speed thing where you heard manufacturing at risk, that as soon as the vaccines are released for emergency use authorization, you're going to have a, a bucket load of vaccine. It's not the case. Uh, it's one of the, dis among the disappointments of Operation Warp Speed. So the vaccines are still available in limited quantities. So, you know, whatever center you go to or sign up, they may only have one type of vaccine, J&J, &J, Moderna, or Pfizer. Two others are going to come along later. And my point is, take it. Uh, and because one thing we don't know about any of these vaccines is how durable, long-lasting the protection is. We don't know for any of them, are they six months or six years or 60 years? And we're not going to know that for a while. So um, don't, uh, don't, don't hesitate uh, to take any of those vaccines, point one. The other point is uh, likely they're all going to need an extra booster later on in the year or next year. So you're hearing J&J, &J, oh, wonderful, it's a one-dose vaccine. It's going to be a two-dose vaccine mm -hmm. sometime in the fall of next year. The Moderna Pfizer vaccine, a two-dose vaccine, it's going to be a three-dose vaccine. You're going to need to get a boost later on or next year. And the reason is to, one, increase, improve the durability of protection, but also um, to get these new variants, including the one coming out of Brazil and South Africa. It, the, the boost is going to be a little bit different to target those variants. So keep that in mind as well. And, and if you're saying it sounds pretty complicated, well, it is. And this is why we've got to step our, our level of communication, because, because people getting the vaccine it's going to require a lot of situational awareness. You're going to have to stay close to the news and listen to shows like this so, so people can stay informed. So is there research going on now as it relates to getting the boost? So there's actually live studies going on now to actually develop the boost that will come out later? That's exactly right. In fact, we're doing, I'm on Zoom calls all day and night because, you know, we thought we had it covered because we had the vaccine to the original strain. Now we're all scrambling to make the uh, booster for the South African and the Brazilian one. Um, it's not a big worry right now because in the US, um, we don't think it's gonna be an immediate problem. The one that really worries us right now is that UK variant that's spreading across the country, especially in the Southern states, Georgia, Texas, Florida. Um, the good news is all of the Operation Warp Speed vaccines work beautifully against the UK variants. And that's not the worry, it's okay. just, spreading rapidly. So the boost is for what's coming down the pike for South Africa and Brazil. It's not here okay. in a big way yet, but later on it might be. Thank you. That really, someone is thanking for that clarification on the difference between, that's very helpful. Dr. Cooper, I'm gonna wanna join our local expert. Why don't I go back to you before I ask our local experts because one of the questions I've seen from the audience, how do we make sure that we begin to address some of the concerns in the African-American community in terms of giving black and brown people greater sense of security to take mm -hmm. the vaccine. But I want you to share a little bit. We know in, in terms of what I'll call it Dr. Kizzy, but we know there were black researchers and black doctors and black involvement. Tell us more about what you know about that. Sure, happy to do that. Well, as you just mentioned, I think what is would be helpful for people to know is that this vaccine was developed with uh, you know, scientists of color were involved in the development of several of these vaccines. Um, you know, probably the person best known is Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, an immunologist at NIH who was involved in the development of the Moderna vaccine. But there were also scientists of color involved in the designs of the trials and also lots of people of color in the trial. So I served on the data safety and monitoring board for the Moderna vaccine. And I can tell you how often we met. We met every week. 
We looked at the data on the people being vaccinated. We looked very carefully at any side effects or any adverse effects that would be going on. If there was anything questionable, the study would be stopped until we could determine with, you know, with confidence that it was not related to the vaccine. So, you know, it, these studies have been done very carefully. Um, there have been large numbers of people of African descent, of, of uh, European descent, as well as, you know, Hispanics in these trials. So very diverse populations, diverse groups of scientists. And, um, you know, so it's not as if, you know, um, it, it hasn't been tried on people and that we're now being experimented upon. So I think it's really important for people to know that and to know that, the you know, the things that happened in the past with science and people of color, they can't happen in this day and age because there have been so many rules and laws and regulations put in place that there's no way that um, anyone would be able to conduct a study where they didn't do all the things that they needed to do to protect the safety of the people being enrolled in the study and to make sure that people knew what they were signing up for and that they gave their consent and that all of their safety was like a primary concern. So I think people should feel comfortable with that. And I think they should also know that I was comfortable enough with it that I've taken the vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, you know, because I, I knew how well the study was done and I knew the care and uh, rigor with which um, the vaccines were developed. Thank you for sharing that. We do know, I, I want to apologize. I talk, call her Dr. Corbett, Dr. Kizzy, affectionately. I don't know her personally, <laughs> but she is a UMBC alum. And so I am a UMBC graduate. And so I'm giving my shout out in terms of the absolute um, black scientists that UMBC has produced. And I do know that Dr. Freeman Robowski and his wife, Jackie, actually participated in the trials as well in terms of their confidence in that. But I wanna go to our local experts in terms of you all are on the ground. You're right here. You're involved in this every day in terms of your respective jurisdictions, which both have a significant number of African-Americans and Latino and Hispanic citizens. Tell us more about what you've been doing and you've heard from both Dr. Cooper and Dr. Ortez in terms of what we know is out there, some of the concerns. How are you addressing those concerns would be my first question. And my second question that I would ask you to share with the audience is what should they expect? When they come in, they've gotten the appointment, that precious appointment, and they come in, what will it look like? What will that process be like for them? But first, if you can share with it in general, from your perspective, what you all have been doing on the ground. And I'm gonna to go to Dr. McDowell in terms of first, and then come back to you, Dr. Branch, if that's acceptable. Thank you. Sure, great. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. It's, it's so great to be here again. In regards to the Baltimore City Health Department, um, our overarching, overarching strategy is two-prong. One, it's about access. So how do we, um, our goal is to vaccinate at least 80% of Baltimore City residents in a year. So by February, 2022, that's including the pediatric population. So that's kind of about the access, access side of things. In regards to what we've been speaking about um, in trust building, um, equitable distribution, um, education about the vaccine and also vaccine deliberation or, or hesitancy that um, some groups might have, uh, such as the African-American community for the reasons that um, Dr. Cooper mentioned. We also have our second part of our strategy is to reduce this vaccine hesitation, now really kind of being termed as deliberation, right? Because some people are hesitant for reasons that, as mentioned, as, as Dr. Cooper mentioned, and that might be a healthy hesitancy. Um, so how do we allow individuals by providing in, like information uh, that is data informed, um, information that is accurate about the vaccine, um, to really overcome that, um, for allow individuals to make informed decisions. And um, while they're deliberating, um, really have the information to make those informed decisions. So that is one part of our strategy um, is around that. How that is actually being implemented um, on the ground level is that the health department is working with what we call value communities, which we've identified. And value community stands for vaccine acceptance and access lives in unity, engagement, and equity. 
These are communities where there's nine of them that we have identified that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, also communities that might have barriers to access to um, the vaccination, um, might have uh, barriers to access to um, the, the broadband internet that is needed to interface with the state system known as prep mod or register. Um, I won't go through all of them, but um, it is nine. It includes, again, the African-American community, the Latinx community, um, immigrant and refugees, pregnant and lactating persons, individuals experiencing homelessness as well. Um, young men as well are, are included in this and that, that's not the totality. But what we are doing is um, having listening sessions for all of these valued communities. These listening sessions, there are individuals that know the community, are from the community, will allow us to um, from uh, take out themes that are emerging from these listening sessions. What does the community feel about the vaccine, the vaccines themselves, but also about the experience of being vaccinated? The second part of your question, you know, what will you expect? How are we actually relaying that information? Is the information that we're relaying as the health department, is it sufficient? So we're getting that constant feedback and those themes are emerging. Um, when those themes emerge, they then are taken back to our value communities leads that also know the community themselves. And it's informing the way that we develop educational materials, um, that we do our outreach in, in those specific communities as well. Um, and also how we also approach this from an intersectional approach. We know that there's multiple people that fit within multiples of those value communities as well. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of what we're doing on the ground. Also, in regards to those listening sessions, there are vaccine peer ambassadors that have been identified that are coming out of those listening sessions that are being trained on uh, the vaccine itself, like the, the basics of the science of the vaccine and also where they can, information about accessing the vaccine and asking those questions, because we know that those one-on-one -on -one conversations, that word of mouth is going to be able to build trust, especially when it's coming from someone that's trusted in the community. So that is something that we are actively engaging with now and in doing on the ground to address those concerns as, as we have mentioned, those longstanding concerns of contemporary and historical racism and discrimination um, that are, it's very real. Um, but we also know that, you know, the, the, there is a narrative that this is about um, uh, hesitancy, overall about vaccine hesitancy. And maybe that is a portion of it, but it also is the access piece. It's also being able to have the information to make those decisions that are informed and to have that deliberation. Um, so that's what's occurring at the, a small part of the work that's occurring at the health department to address those concerns. And so then, part, go ahead. So I was just gonna say, that's a part of what you just described a part of what both Dr. Cooper and Dr. Hortez described in terms of all the issues that are concerning them in terms of being out there. And what you have just described is what the city health department is doing to ensure that those issues come to light and strategies to address those in terms of being able to get that in front of people in terms of recognizing, I think Dr. Hortez talked about in terms of the pharmacy deserts in terms of for many exactly. of the black and brown communities. Yes. And having that, I wanna, cause I don't wanna run out of time. I wanna go to Dr. Branch and Dr. Branch, I, I wanna say, as you answer this question, I know from obviously it was in the news media in terms of you have a particular insight to this, both as a physician and your own journey in terms of it in this time, in terms of COVID. But I know that the Baltimore County Health Department, as I've followed the news, has been doing also a number of innovative things and in trying to get facts out to the public. Can you share with us? Of course I can. And thank you for having me today. Um, I will say to you that our motto in Baltimore County is that the success of a vaccine campaign is seen in and measured by the number of vaccines we put into black and brown arms. Now, this is not something that's new. We have been in Baltimore County practicing and rehearsing for this pandemic for over 10 years. 
And the governor recently toured the Timonium Fairgrounds and said that that was one of the best run facilities he's seen across the state. So why is that? For over 10 years, I've had my health department rehearsing and practicing giving out flu vaccines every year. And we gave them out at our Super Saturday. Seven different councilmatic locations, simultaneously mass vaccine clinics. So we practiced this and we had it down. I will tell you at this particular time, my injectors can do 30 to 40 injections per hour. And at the Timonium Fairgrounds at this particular time, we're easily doing five to 700 vaccines per hour and can do up to a thousand without any problem at all. We've been practicing, we've got this down, but I told you the success of a vaccine campaign is not just putting it into arms, but putting it into black and brown arms. And when I started this 10 years ago, I was not planning on having some type of registry on a computer. We just weren't thinking like that at all because what we were doing, we just having people walk in, right? So now that changed and we recognize that. So therefore we have a very efficient um, program going on in Baltimore County at all of our places. What can people expect? When you come to Timonium Fairgrounds and drive up on a parking lot, we have folks who are driving golf carts who will drive you from the parking lot to get into the clinic. When you get there, if you need it, we have people who are transportation coordinators and ambassadors who will actually roll you through to wherever you have to get in that particular clinic. When we're doing five to 700 vaccines an hour, there is less than a 15 minute wait to get your vaccine from the start to the finish. I say all of this because people are looking at the news and thinking to themselves, when I go to that clinic, I gotta be there for five hours. That is not the case in Baltimore County. So I don't want that to be a reason why somebody does not come. Understanding that, I recognize that there are barriers by which black and brown people are not able to get to or get access to the clinic. So what we've done is we partnered with Uber and we will give you a ride from your house to the clinic and back to your house. If you get an appointment, we got you a ride. Uber will take care of that. If you are homebound, we have partnered with the fire department and what we do is be basically a nurse and an EMT is in an ambulance and we drive from person to person's house um, who are homebound and we give them their vaccination at their home. We are now partnering with the different churches around Baltimore County to have um, not NAS clinics. These are smaller clinics in um, in areas where people are familiar with and feel comfortable with. So they don't mind coming over to the neighborhood church or the neighborhood community center. And they, we, we're having vaccine clinics there. And so that they can actually make it to that. And we also have mobile vaccine units that are going around in different neighborhoods and we're basically um, giving vaccines out. What's actually happening right now is that I don't have enough vaccine. Ah. So until I get more vaccine, I can do all of those things. Let me kind of give you a number. I get 4,900 vaccines per week. And I can tell you right now that 75 and over on my list in the registry is over 35,000. Oh. So it's going to, I, I can't, I got the school system to do. I got so many to do. That's only 75 and over. That wasn't even 65 and over. So until I get more vaccine, it's hard for me to really get out there and, um, and flood the communities with the vaccine. But I am prayerful. And I am hoping at this particular time that in the next couple of weeks, it's going to rain down with some vaccine. And when it does and it gets into my hands, I will get it into folks' arms, specifically the black and brown people. 
So what you're going to expect, come on out, come get your vaccine. It's not a bad experience at all when you're in Baltimore County. So Dr. Branch, I want to ask you a question. Dr. Hotez, you want to have a remark you wanted to make? I'm going to see. Yes. Uh, what I want you to do is record Dr. Branch's remarks, and that should be played on every radio station in the United States. So <laughs> I, I, I'm inspired by your eloquence and your passion. And, and, and that's another story that we're not hearing about. You know, we always hear negative things coming out of the black and brown community. We don't hear about leaders like this, you know, that, that are being innovative and, and, you know, taking ownership and doing extraordinary things. You know, you remind me a lot about our mayor in Houston, uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner, uh, Harvard Law School graduate, just real brilliant guy, same kind of inspiration. You know, he saw the pharmacy deserts he took the initiative to build out those sites and, and make things like that happen. And that, that's a really inspirational story. I just love everything you said. I actually think, thanks for sharing, I actually think that we have a lot of that in this lane, at least for Baltimore County, as well as for Baltimore City. Mayor, um, our Mayor Brandon Scott pushed along with Baltimore County around the need for more equitable distribution of the vaccinations in terms of really push hard about that and the need for that. That's been very a very large conversation and finding alternative ways to get that out to the community. I know that our hospitals in Baltimore and Hopkins included and others have been trying to figure out a way because it's not centralized, how they can be creative in terms of partnering. I do know some of the smaller churches that have become part of the smaller sites, not for massive, but for that. And I can tell you from the feedback that I've heard from some of those churches, how much difference that makes for their parishioners. Many of them are older parishioners for some of that to be able to come to the church and be able to be, feel comfortable. In terms of one of the questions I wanna to begin to open up for the audience, but one of the questions was, what would it take to give black and brown people a greater sense of security to take the COVID vaccine? And then question to you, Dr. Branch, do I have to be 65 to get the vaccine at Timonian? And then another question was around how do I register as soon as possible for your site in terms of that? We do know supply is a challenge, but if you can address that question, any of you, but I know for the Timonian question was for you, Dr. Branch. I will go and I will try to answer as many questions as I can. Mm -hmm. For Baltimore County site, you can go to Baltimore County um, MD.gov slash vaccine registry, or just look up on the um, internet, Baltimore County vaccine registry, it'll come up and then you can actually do that. Um, let me just kind of remember the other questions that you had. Um, what else was it? The other question was about, do I have to be 65 to get okay. to Antimonium? Right. And right at this moment now, we are doing 1A and 1B. And, we, and when you're in Maryland, you understand that. And that basically is 75 and over. Okay. Stay tuned. I'm here breaking news on ABC. Baltimore County may, may, I'm only saying may, be moving to 1C pretty soon. Okay. And so at that particular time, it would be 65. Okay. However, anyone, anyone can register um, on our registry. And once we are doing um, um, your priority group, we will call you in. We'll pull out from the register. Yes. And also remember that there are other jurisdictions who are already doing 1C. So that means 65 and, um, and, and over can go to other jurisdictions too. And I know that's what Dr. McDowell wants to share with us. Yeah. 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 So I do want to, I do want to share and in Baltimore City, we are in, in 1C prioritizing our older adults that are 65 and plus. So we, um, similar to Baltimore County, um, started January 29th with mobile response teams um, where we go out to senior housing sites, bringing the vaccine to seniors. We've partnered with a number of our hospital systems um, and also our pharmacy partners. Um, we have weekly about six sites, uh, six mobile response teams that are out vaccinating older adults. 
Um, and in addition to that, individuals um, with intellectual or developmental disability that live in that independent living facility or senior housing site as well. So we, as of January 29th to period, have vaccinated over 2,000 um, older adults that are 65 and plus and individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities living in that house by bringing vaccine to them. Um, in addition, we have a, you can go onto our site at um, coronavirus.baltimorecity.gov and there is an interest form for individuals that are 65 and older to sign up. You can also call the Maryland Access Point um, hotline as well. Um, and I'll, I'll put that number in the chat box. That's specific for you know Baltimore City residents that are older adults to get appointment. So right now we're really prioritizing our older adult population. Um, we have one in three older adults in Baltimore City have received the vaccine, um, and we're looking to increase that as we go. Um, and so and also expand our our vaccination points as well in regards to our mobile response teams. Um, so that that is something that I, I definitely want to highlight. Um, and in regards to, you know, the prioritization, we at the city are very, I would say, focused on, as mentioned, equity. So how do we make sure that we have a strategy, a strategic plan to, and that we are operationalizing it to ensure that there's equitable distribution and access to the vaccine? One of those is um, the mobile response teams is, is a big piece of that. Another big piece of that is we know for Baltimore City in and of itself, we are vaccinating the vaccine that um, we, we vaccinate individuals that are Baltimore City residents and then also individuals that are from other, other counties or jurisdictions or even states. And right now about, um, and this is on our dashboard, we have a COVID vaccine dashboard that you can go to. All of our data is there, 100% transparent, broken down by age, race, um, ethnicity, gender as well, how well we're doing in regards to the counts of vaccine and then the percentage of the population that is vaccinated. We also have a breakdown and a pie chart and of the individuals that we're vac vaccinating across the city with the multiple partners, there's about 26 vaccine sites in Baltimore City. Um, about 36% of those are reaching Baltimore City residents, Excellent. which I got not. I Dr. I want to make sure I get the question from one of our audience. Oh, sure. That because I don't want to lose them in terms of their questions. But one of the questions, I, and this is not the first time I've heard this question, and I know you gave a number, but with a lack of technology for people 65 plus, won't that hold up the other people waiting who are under that age? And although I do know about the phone number, what I hear back from many citizens is that they can't, and I don't know, I don't want to say this is everyone, because certainly I don't know everyone, but they that they have problems getting to that. And I don't know there's a website, uh, actually I joined in terms of Facebook, Vaccine Hunters, in terms of Maryland, people are helping each other find the sites. I'm that person for my family of helping to find. But for those persons 65 and over, recognizing what both of you identified the technology gap for our older citizens. How do we make sure that we, as many resources as possible can help those citizens that we may not even know about that is not living in congregate care, but they're living alone in their home, 65 yeah. and over and they know how to get there. Yeah, so, so mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, Dr. Branch. I, I was just going to say for Baltimore County, um, you, if you're in Baltimore County, you can call 311 and they will assist you. Also, mm -hmm. you can call the 410-887-3816 um, and, um, and they will take your information down and the Department of Aging will call you and Excellent. will make the appointment for you. Excellent. This is the only issue that we have now. I don't have enough vaccine. Yes. So even though you've called and you've left your information, I may not get back to you immediately. But as I said, I hope and pray next two or three weeks, we'll be raining down vaccine and then I'll be able to call all those people back. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the problem, right? I mean, the rains are going to come. I, I know that. The problem is that it's not going to come till June. And, uh, and we have to figure out a way through this now. This is going to be the toughest time. You know, and as Dr. McDowell pointed out as well, loved your comments. You know, this is going to be a, a difficult time. 
end of March, uh, April, May, and if we could just hang on and get through this, then then you know, the mother load of vaccines is coming. But it's going to be rough for the next few weeks, and this is why staying disciplined, you know, keeping masks, social distancing, especially, oh, yeah. it's, it's not a time to lose your life, right? When yeah. when you know all, all the all the other vaccines are coming. So I'm going to be, as I apologize, Dr. McDowell, but I'm going to be mindful as a moderator that we're about out of time. And so I want to check in and it, I, time went by very fast to make sure we don't have any other questions from our audience. And just to repeat, this is recorded and this will go out to all those that signed up for it. We certainly will make sure you all each have a copy of it to share. This is so important. I think Dr. Hortez said it, Dr. Cooper said it, you all said it, to make sure we get the information out to the public, the facts, just the facts, and do as much as we can, all that you are doing in terms of getting the information out to our public. For us, for ABC, our agenda is around closing the racial wealth gap. We know that that is largely Black people that have lack of opportunity for economic mobility, and all of this impacts them. We know that opportunity is embedded because of the root issue of structural racism. And that is why we felt it was important to have this conversation for the public in terms of the Baltimore regional community. I wanna to go to Dr. Cooper and ask Dr. Cooper to make one last statement. And then I'm gonna go around and Dr. Hortez, I'm gonna end with you as our special guest in terms of a last statement. And you each have got 60 seconds, <laughs> sorry. No, this is fine. I, I just wanna you know, say the same message that others have said is like, hang in there, we're, we're getting close. Um, a lot of people I know actually who signed up, you know, weeks and weeks ago have been called to get their vaccines. So don't give up. And just remember that, you know, this is something that affects all of us. So if you have a computer or you have internet access, check it on your neighbors, check on your uh, older family members and, and help them get registered and signed up for vaccines. The sooner, everyone gets vaccinated, the better it is for all of us. So I think that that's important and remembering that you're doing this for yourself. It's This vaccine is going to save lives, whichever one you get, uh, even though you've heard different, you know, levels of protection. I think even the ones that, that the, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that supposedly has lower uh, effectiveness, it's really, um, it's, they're equally effective against severe COVID-19. And so, you know, you don't want to die from this. So if you end up getting a vaccine that isn't as effective, it just may mean that you get a mild version like a, a cold or a flu, but you won't get sick enough to die. So it's really important to take any vaccine there is and help out everyone who's around you if you have the ability to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. Dr. McDowell, and then I'll go to Dr. Branch. Dr. McDowell. I saw yeah. you put in the chat the information to call. So I don't want to waste your minute on that one. We've got the information out there. We want to hear from you. Great. Um, I would say, first off, definitely the vaccines are, are life-saving. Um, the vaccines are effective um, and they're safe as well. Um, in addition to that, we know that 500,000 plus individuals have, have died from, from COVID. Um, disproportionately from African American. Um, and we really need to, myself included, weighing um, the, the uh, deliberation around the vaccine in regards to the side effects, those short-term side effects for long-term gain of being protected from COVID-19. In saying that, once we get the a sufficient vaccine in place, uh, once you get vaccinated as an individual, we must continue to mask, we must continue to social distance. We're going to have to continue all of that because it's not just us, you know, the, the individuals that are getting vaccinated now will be the first, honestly, the first in the world. I think Dr. Hortez also mentioned this about vaccines availability in other parts of the world as well. And um, this really is going to take, a, we can say herd immunity, but a herd humanity approach 
where we all are doing our part by getting vaccinated, by wearing our masks, by social distancing, um, by practicing our hand hygiene until we collectively get to a point where um, this pandemic will end. So I just wanted to say that and to say thank you and extremely appreciative and that we are working um, to ensure that Baltimore City residents, um, Maryland residents in general have access to the vaccine and also that it's being done in an equitable manner. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. Dr. Branch. I'm just going to take my 60 seconds to say the three W's. Wear your masks, wash your distance, and wash your hands. And I got a fourth W today. Welcome whichever vaccine you are fortunate enough to receive. Because remember, vaccines don't save lives. Vaccinations do. So get vaccinated. Do it for yourself. Do it for your family. Do it for your community. Please, just Thank do you, it. Thank you, Dr. Brandt, the four W's. Dr. Hertez, again, thank you. And I want to give you the closing words. Well, thanks. Uh, I really, I, I feel very inspired tonight. Um, you know, it's such, to see such leadership, you know, coming out of the African-American community. We just need you all over the country. That, that's the problem. I need to clone everybody and, uh, and put you in and you populate every uh, major city in the United States. I was really inspired by what you have to say. Look, we have good news. The good news is this, the vaccines not only protect you against severe, severe illness, keep you out of the hospital, out of the ICU and save your lives, that we've known for a few months, but the new information coming out of some big studies in Israel with two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, it stops transmission also. And what that means is if everybody gets vaccinated by the summer, we could vaccinate our way out of this epidemic this new information. So we've got a lot to look forward to. I don't want to say life's going to get completely back to normal, but it's going to look so much better than anything we've seen for 14, 15 months. So we have a lot to be grateful for. As everyone has said, it's just a matter of hanging on until we get all of those vaccine doses coming in June. And, you know, you've got people like, you know, Dr. McDowell, Dr. Branch, uh, Dr. Cooper, you know, thinking day and night uh, how to maximize the few vaccine doses that we have, life's going to get a lot better. Thank you again. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you especially to our audience. We look forward to seeing you again in terms of the audience and we do our webinar in April in terms of we will continue to share information, not just COVID, but as it relates to this journey around how do we deal with this really the root issue for so many of the challenges facing the African-American community, but certainly the issue in terms of around structural racism. And so we know that racial equity is a journey we're moving towards. Thank you again all.